All right, guys, let's take a look at Chris Morrell. Chris Morrell uh, was kind of on my radar last year because he, I don't know, hit, what was it, 26 or so home runs. It says he weighs 145 and is 5'11". It doesn't really look like that to me. First of all, it doesn't look like he's 5'11", but it doesn't look like he weighs just 145. That's a really small person, 145, 5'11". I mean, 145 is a small person. 5'11 is actually bigger than average. But anyways, I don't know what the deal is with that. It's really strange. Fangraphs has him at 145. Baseball Reference has him at 145. And I don't know what's going on with that. It Honestly, it can't be right. But let me know what you guys think. I don't know what the deal is. Everywhere I checked, he, they say 145. Fangraphs usually has his his right uh, the player's current, more current weight, more realistic weight. What Baseball Reference has is their weight starting in the major leagues. So maybe he was just rail thin. But I even checked pictures of him when he first came into the major leagues. He didn't look that small. And at 5'11", you know, you'd have to be noticeably thin and frail to be 145. Let's look at his swing anyways. You know, he's he's producing some power nonetheless. So let's take a look. And he's not he's not an extremely big guy for sure, but I just don't think he's as small as what they say. Um I should explain that the way I come about this is through what I call lead arm dominant understanding of the swing. And that just means that the better swings tend to come from people who, when they were developing their swing, they were more dominant in the lead arm. That's what that means. doesn't mean that the lead arm does more and the back arm does less. That's, that has to do with the structure that's created when you're first learning the swing. And uh, basically, if you're dominant in your lead arm, that means you're equally less dominant in your back arm. And that's what you want when you're developing the structure of your swing. So what I do is I lead you through a process where you basically take away the dominance of your back arm and find a structure that is what I call lead arm dominant. So um, you can check out that process uh, in my Swing Like Griffey book at theswingmechanic.com. It explains the whole process in that, explains my whole method and how I came about this understanding of the swing, which is, by the way, growing very fast. It rings true with people. Um, one of the best parts about it, not only is it based on scientific fact, uh, David Mann has studied that you are much more likely to make the Hall of Fame if you're dominant in your lead arm. That's been scientifically proven. Um, but also, the whole process completely revolutionizes how we've approached swing instruction up to now in that you're able to just not worry about forcing positions and and being so stiff and robotic in your swing because you're trying to catch all these different positions in a one second movement for crying out loud um, and instead it allows you to flow into the swing Find your own best way to be what I call lead arm dominant. Find your own best swing within that particular caveat. And that's the only caveat. If you're lead arm dominant and you look different than most lead arm dominant uh, swings, that's fine. That's the way you do lead arm dominance. But what's great about this process is that it, it, it factors in that people have to flow in their own unique way. Um, the Again, the only rule that I want to apply is find a lead arm dominant structure to the swing. And then from there, stop thinking about mechanics. Stop being so robotic. Believe it or not, I know you, a lot of you guys are bought into the conventional thinking, but it is flawed. And, and sooner or later, guys will uh, start to regress the more that they jump into this conventional understanding and everyone out there is conventional if you're not talking lead arm dominance you're in the conventional paradigm and it is eventually it's going to bite you 
it may help for whatever reason in the beginning. Many, many swing cues will help in the beginning. It may even help for a year or two. But the more you lean on it, the more it's going to have you regressing because it's not landing on the truth. Uh, it's not touching on the truth when it comes to swing mechanics. I think you have to talk about lead arm dominance. If that's not in your conversation when you're talking about the swing, then you're off track. Um, and I, and I, that's why I see pretty much every other method out there as being off track completely. Um, the conversation must begin with lead arm dominance. And that's what we see here from Chris Morrell. Notice this action of the barrel. This is indicative of lead arm dominance. There are many different traits, different positions that are indicative of a lead arm dominant structure happening. Um, they don't, they're not positions that I chase. I'm not like trying to force students' swings into this uh, lead arm dominant into any particular uh, position or movement. Again, I just say, let me see your swing with your lead arm. And, and let's, let's spend some time. With some people, you have to spend a little time in it because they're a little bit more stubborn um, and established in the conventional approach. And so you have to say, you know what? Why don't you take the summer, <laughs> if it's, it has to be that long, or a week and just hit with just your lead arm see how far you can hit the ball have some fun go to the park see if you can re you know break your record from the day before try to just hit the ball far off a tee and see what movement you arrive at because your body's going to have to align itself in a more uh lead arm dominant structure obviously if you're swinging with just your lead arm and it's going to have to get more involved you can't hit the ball far without the biggest muscles of your body, your torso, your legs, getting involved. Um, and the fact that you're not using your back arm means that it can't get in the way. And that's what it likes to do. Why? Because most of us are really dominant in our back arm. It's human nature to want to exert with the back arm. Um, and the only way that that really gets rewired is to teach the back arm how to behave. Um, anyways, this movement where the barrel kind of, watch how it, it like moves away from his head as he's getting more front humerus compression. You see that? Boom. That little, how it's, it creates a, probably a foot of space between his helmet and the barrel as he's starting his forward swing. A back arm dominant hitter will do the opposite. He'll start to, to push outward with the hands and the barrel will actually get a little bit closer to the head. So the, again, just not something that I'd necessarily try to force. It's just these are positions and movements that are communicating to me that this player is in, has lead arm dominance here. This is lead arm dominance going on in this particular section of the swing. Good. So now I see... All right, can you screw it up from here? Sure, I suppose you could, but this is really the key movement in the swing. Your body, it's kind of, I think of it as train tracks. At this moment of redirection from the backswing into the forward swing or the stride into the forward swing, however you want to say it, is really a key movement because right here in the swing, look at where he is, you don't want to be back arm dominant. You don't want to push out with the back arm. You kind of put the back arm in a position where it's handcuffed a bit. So that it's kind of the point of no return in both scenarios. If you start the fire out with the hands, what are you going to do from there? I mean, yeah, you, you could still, I see people still have decent movements and very lead arm dominant movements through contact, even if they screw up, so-called screw up the beginning part of the swing. But... It's just, it, I kind of think of it like a, like a high dive. Like a high dive lasts maybe a little longer than swing. I don't know. But, you know, they're being judged on all these different parts of the dive. You know, the beginning part, maybe the, 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 the ending part just before he splashes and then the splash. So it's like you're, 
the swing is kind of the same way. The, and your stats at the end of the season are the, is the judge for the most part. Um, and, of course, how that relates with your, your body weight would be the judge of, of how good your mechanics are. And he's nailing the first part of the swing here to me. And it's virtually impossible to screw it up from here. Um, like I said, the, the back arm is just in a, in a handcuffed position. This is the position most people say, oh, it's terrible. You're dragging the barrel. It's exactly what they've been saying for years, for decades now, that you don't want to do. But yet, look at the video, guys. Look at the video. I mean, literally every great pound-for-pound -pound hitter um, gets into a position like this. You know, they all have their own kind of way of doing it. But what's going on here? Again, it doesn't do anything to just chase positions. You have to find out what is what are the positions communicating to you. I believe that they're communicating a lead arm dominant action. When he was learning the swing, for whatever reason, probably because he used heavy bats maybe, or maybe he started at such a young age that his arms just weren't strong enough, so he defaulted to a more lead arm dominant action. Remember, the lead arm can just catch a free ride from your body. So if your arms, both arms, aren't strong enough, you're going to default to a lead arm dominant action. That's why we see little, little kids with a lead arm dominant action. You know, the, the, the lead arm gets compressed up against their body quite a bit. They have a lot of flexibility in that, in that way. Um, and they develop a great swing most of the time. But th that's exactly what, on a large scale we coach out of kids like literally i think of it like a factory like that's what america is right now is like a factory for changing kids swings like they don't get through the system without having these beautiful positions that they create naturally taken out of their swing and this is why we're losing to countries with not even half the population we have many times one hundredth think about that one hundredth of the population we have and we're supposed to be the powerhouse we're supposed this is our national pastime we created this game like there's no reason why except for we have gotten off track when it comes to mechanics and i know a lot of people think that a lot of these present day approaches are on track you know um that that a lot of these instagram uh and youtube hitting coaches with their different understanding of the swing is, you know, they have it figured out. I don't see any of these guys having it figured out, again, because they're not talking about lead arm dominance and the importance of creating a lead arm dominance structure. And until we address that main problem, we're missing 95% of swing mechanics. That's the way I look at it. And I'm being generous with 95. I think that's pretty much, truthfully, I think that's all you need to focus on. There's enough to worry about. There's enough things to work on with hitting. There are many other things. You need, to, you need to get your mechanics down and then move on. If you think that mechanics are something you should be always working on for the rest of your playing career, look, the greatest hitters didn't even think about their mechanics. There's no evidence that the greatest pound-for-pound -pound hitters ever even thought about their mechanics. Um... And that's the way, you, that's where you want to get to. And if it takes today or if it takes a year to get to that point where you never have to really, I mean, you know, you only have to maybe touch up on your mechanics every once in a while would be ideal. Um, that's what you want to shoot for. We're not looking to always be working on mechanics. Anyways, look at how dropped the barrel is. Look at how much he's just dragging the barrel. He's dragging the barrel, guys. How, how could he possibly hit major league pitching? Not only hit it, but at a, as a lightweight hitter, hit 26, I believe, home runs. I could be wrong, but somewhere in that area. How? How could he possibly do it if he was doing such a big flaw? All the hitting coaches out there say, this is the main flaw in the swing. How in the heck would he be able to not only survive in the major leagues, but like thrive in the major leagues with such a big flaw doesn't make any sense i think you guys going 
down the street to your local hitting coach, you're probably getting worse. And if you're not, it's despite what he's teaching. It's not that you've gotten lucky because many times they're just teaching exactly what you don't want to, to do. It's crazy. I, I don't get it. Um, but look at how drop the barrel is here. And you guys, a lot of you guys are look, look at how the back arm and bat stay in line for a long time. Another uh, position movement uh, that indicates lead arm dominance. It's an indication of lead arm dominance. That's all. But he has this kind of casting move. The way the barrel kind of, notice how all the pressure is being put on that lead shoulder and the back shoulder. It's almost like if someone was going to just push your hands back. But not, you're not, he's not feeling as much pressure as most people do in the wrists at this point. It's all, and this would be a, literally a change that you guys could make that would, it could be night and day difference. If you just feel this one difference right here, just feel less pressure as you, like almost try to feel like no pressure in your hands and give it all to the shoulders at, at the redirection point. Like you see here from Morel, look at how there's almost no bat lag. Bat lag is like that angle like this, the, that pressure that you feel as you redirect. This allows him to get the barrel into the zone early in relation to his hand extension. So he can get the barrel into the zone while he's still well connected. This can be a change that you guys can just implement like for your next game and be a completely different hitter. Let's see uh, another swing of his. Same, you're going to see the same thing. The lead arm gets very straight. You're seeing that casting sort of move for, of the barrel. And look at how he's just dropping. The barrel's just flattening out as his lead arm is getting more compressed up against his body. And I don't know. There's so much overthinking the swing because there's so much overcomplicating the swing because people don't understand this one main concept that you must start on in order to get everything else right which is lead arm dominance so therefore everyone just overcomplicate it's just a hodgepodge of positions that they want you to achieve and there's no it's just confusing i don't i don't really care about what his body is doing. His body's just delivering. I care about it, but I'm not. However you want to move your body when you're doing lead arm dominant structure is the way you want to move your body. It's the way your body says, this is the best way for me to, to deliver force. Why would I mess with that? And, but again, that's what conventional instructors want to do. They want to, they want to confine and restrict your, your body movement. They want to, Really take out the rotation, the body rotation. Where do you think the power is coming from? Like this is ish, these are things that people talk about. His foot's coming off the ground. I'd like you to keep your foot on the ground. Let's try to, in fact, let's keep your knee on the ground. Let's do some drills where you're keeping your knee on the ground, and 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 just keep restricting and restricting and restricting. There you can see the wide finish again, right? This tells me that he's in the lead arm dominant structure. And you're going to have a much more wide finish. If you're a guy who takes the hands to the ball and flips, that's what happens when you take your hands to the ball. If you'd now do this more, feel more pressure on your shoulders, get the hands more behind and less pressure on your wrists as you start forward, you're going to have a wider finish necessarily. Um... And there you can see a beautiful finish. That's what you want to see. Now, I, I wanted to get video of this because, tell me, does this look like a 145-pound guy? He's 5'11", and he looks like this. By the way, why is his shirt off? Anyways, doesn't look like a 145-pound guy to me. 5'11", looks like that. I would say he's, I, I don't know what's going on because, to me, 
He looks like a 190, a 185. Like, he's not even close to 145. I don't know what's going on. Um, very bizarre. Uh, so, I know that you guys wanted me to do... Um, look at him. Look at this WWE stuff. Look, just walking past the... The lady wants to stop him. But he's like, no, I'm way too cool for you at this moment. I have like 10 of you at the club right now waiting for me, okay? Um, but honestly, look at him. 185 at, at least. So his swing is very similar to the number six best pound-for-pound -pound hitter of all time, Albert Bell. Look how he casts the bat outward. See how he does? He's, he's feeling most of the pressure in his shoulders. Another great thing about this is a lot of guys will put so much pressure on their wrists as they redirect that they kind of tighten up their wrists and then they stay kind of tight throughout the swing. What's great about uh, intentionally starting like this is you can leave the wrists really loose at this redirection point. All the pressure is being put on your shoulders. You're getting the hands behind you. But none of this inertia is being acted on on your, on your lag angle in your hands. So you can keep them really loose. But look, same kind of positioning that you see from Morel. And then a beautiful connected position at contact. I mean, that is honestly textbook. And we're looking at the sixth best pound for pound hitter of all time. Let's look at uh, Jackie Robinson. Not a pound for pound great, but look, my pound for pound equation is not perfect. It's, it's based on home runs. That's not ideal, really. Uh, Jackie Robinson was clearly one of the great hitters of all time, but he didn't hit a tremendous amount of home runs, but he hit a pretty decent amount of home runs. He was more of a high average guy. Bottom line is, he hit the ball hard. You can't have a high average and hit consistent double-digit home runs year after year without doing something right. So at times, my pound-for-pound -pound equation will leave out guys that deserve to be uh, among the pound-for-pound -pound greats. And Robinson is probably one of those. And look at his positioning. Very casted out. I, I don't think that any guy has casted and kind of compressed the, the lead arm as much as Jackie Robinson. No one's done this casted move in the right way to the extreme that Jackie Robinson did. And look at these old-time players. They just stay very upright and kind of put their body into the hit. Um, as opposed to today, everyone's so stiff and they tend to lean back as they're going through contact. The great Jackie Robinson. Look at this move. Just so unique. So aggressive in the lower body. And then look at how there's just almost no lag. I mean, for most of you to feel this, like look at that positioning right there. For most of you guys to feel this, you guys probably have almost 90 degrees of lag more than Jackie Robinson here. Like the bat would probably be like a foot and a half to two feet closer to your head for most of you guys at this point. He, for you guys to feel this, you would have to feel so casted out. I mean, like, try to emulate this position. Like, take a snapshot of this, video yourself, and try to get into this position. You're going to feel like it's not even a baseball swing. And then again, the torso moving into the hit, staying integral. This is what these older guys, one of the things that they did so well because they weren't being coached on the swing in so many wrong ways that hitters are today. And this is what they naturally wanted to do. They were more, they had more of their body into the hit. Now, there you can see kind of a cutoff finish. Maybe that's the reason he didn't have 30 plus homers a year or something like that. You know, maybe he just wasn't going for it as much. He was more, you know, it, it's hard to tell. But I can tell you with this, these positions through the swing, these are great positions through the swing. I mean, a lot of people would look at this and think, that would never work today. Look, it's a black and white video. It would never work today. <laughs> I mean, Albert Bell used the same kind of mechanics. So, um, anyways, 
Hope you guys like this analysis. Check out my website, theswingmechanic.com. You can uh, purchase the Swing Like Griffey book. My lead arm dominant training bat as well is on there, theswingmechanic.com. Thank you guys. Don't forget to subscribe, share the video. I'll see you next time.